Hello, everybody, and welcome to this video where, again, we have found someone who has said some things that aren't factually accurate about Bukowski. Let me say, right off the bat, listen, listen, listen. Do not tangle my words up. I think it's awesome that people are doing videos about Bukowski, and I recommend anyone who fucking does videos on YouTube here who loves fucking Bukowski to do as many videos as you can because I feel like Bukowski gets overlooked and gets a bad rap by the majority of people who read. <laughs> I don't know a better way of putting it. I would also like if there are some women out there who would like to do videos on Bukowski um, that would be great. Um, any underrepresented group doing a video about Bukowski would be great. Because um, I know tons of motherfuckers like Bukowski. But the people who talk about Bukowski always seem to be middle-aged white dudes. And so, like, please, if anyone is out there. No. Okay. So, what I would like to say about this is that the before when I've done videos like this, I just kind of talk about the videos and don't really say a whole lot about what they were, where they could be found, and all this other shit. This one, I do want to show you the video and do kind of like a live response to some of the things on here because I think he did a really good job. A lot of the other videos I've seen on YouTube about Bukowski seem like they were either like the script was an AI generated script and like it just um, there wasn't a whole lot of thought put into it and things of that nature and then on top of that like there have been some videos that people have done where they say right at the beginning of the video like um, I, I, I just started reading Bukowski and I'm excited about it so like I don't want to fucking call them out and like make them feel like shit or anything like that and I hope that this dude here knows I'm not trying to make him feel like crap. I'm just trying to, like, fix, like, inaccuracies, okay? Um, and I don't even know why it's important. But anytime I have an excuse to do a video on Bukowski, I'm going to do it. So let's just call it what it is there, okay? So, um, but yeah, again, give this guy a sub. I haven't watched any other of his videos, but he's got a ton of subs. Um, I'm punching up right now, so it's all good. Um, but, like, he seems like he really fucking cares, and he really likes it. And he says a lot of things that I completely agree with, and I will show you what those things are. Bukowski is one of the most controversial literary figures in the States in the 20th century. People either love him or hate him. He is either completely adored or completely abhorred. But the one thing you can't take away from him is how unapologetically raw and fascinating he is. He has lived quite the life, and his writings about that life are what attracts people to him so dearly. Bukowski is ugly. He's ugly in all of the ways that someone can be ugly. He's ugly inside and outside. He's ugly to himself, and he is ugly to others. But when it comes to his writing, when it comes to his words on the page, they are hope amidst the hopeless, and they are beauty amidst all of the vile. Bukowski truly is is the flower in the concrete jungle, the poet laureate of Skid Row, the bump, the barfly, and the brilliant. Welcome to Brandon's Bookshelf. I'm Brandon, and today's episode four of my newest and most favorite series, So You Want to Read. So far, what I'll say right off the bat, I hope this is actually recording properly. Um, it looks really choppy on my end, but anyway. One thing he said right here is that he's a very ugly person, Bukowski, okay? He's ugly to others, and he's ugly to himself. And I think that is such a strong thing to keep in mind when you read his stuff. Because to me, Bukowski is constantly in this search that he knows will result in failure. He wants there to be beauty in the world. He wants there to be all of these great things. But he knows how humanity is, and he knows how society is, and he knows it's just a fruitless fucking effort. As you will see if you, like, study him, like, 
deeply over the course. One of the things I love about Bukowski is because he published so much, you can really map out his life and see his views change over time and see kind of like a softer side of him as he gets older, you know? Um, it's really awesome. And it just sucks because writers are told not to publish so much. No, don't put out so much stuff, you know, you know, you don't want to overdo it and blah, blah, blah. And like, I feel like when there are writers out there that people really love and want to know more about, when they stagger how they release stuff, you're really separating yourself from your audience. Bukowski is near and dear to my heart. I make no apologies for absolutely loving him. I'm sure that in today's culture, he would be immediately canceled and looked at as a horde man, an absolute misogynist, and that would not be incorrect. But it doesn't take away from what he was able to do with his writing. Bukowski is a microscope on man's nature, and you might not like what you find there, but what you find will be real and it will be authentic. One thing I do want to say about this, Bukowski would be um, canceled in today's world and all this other stuff. I agree that that would probably happen, but if Bukowski was Bukowski today, in today's world, I don't think Bukowski would be saying the same things that he said here, because a lot of the stuff he said was measured. He would say things that was like right on the just going right over the line, not like flying over the line. And there were some instances about that, but that's a topic for a different time. And actually, I think we will talk about that a little bit here. But he was very intelligent in how much he could get away with, you know? And I really feel like he would be measured today. He, he would be appalled by a lot of what goes on today. Bukowski's very steadfast in his ways, but Bukowski also craves acceptance. Like, for instance, for those of you who say he doesn't crave acceptance, if he didn't crave acceptance, he would not have sent out every fucking poem he ever written and every story he ever written. He would just write them and keep them. But he did crave that acceptance. If he didn't crave that acceptance, he wouldn't have written so many poems and stories blasting his peers to get that attention. You know what I'm saying? So that's like just like a whole different thing there. Pretty rough upbringing. He was born in Germany in 1920 to a German woman and an American soldier. By 1930, the family was living in Los Angeles, which is where Bukowski would spend the majority of the rest of his life. Now, this right here, um, him saying by 1930 they were living in Los Angeles. Not that this is a big fucking bitch at all, but if he was born in Germany in 1920, and then him starting elementary school, let's say, let's go out on a fucking limb and say he started when he was six, that would only take us to 1926. So I'm pretty sure his family moved to California much earlier, like right after he was born, basically. Um, I don't have any like numbers in front of me here, but um, so yes, by 1930, he was in Los Angeles. But that makes it sound like he got there in 1930. So minor bitch, I'm just saying. During his childhood in Los Angeles, his father was extremely cruel and they lived a horrible life of abuse and of poverty. By freshman year of high school, Bukowski dropped out. Okay, a couple things here. Saying that Bukowski was living a life of poverty, you, you can say he was living a life of poverty, but this was the Great Depression and everyone was living a life of poverty, basically. Like, if you were middle class, you were in poverty. His family, like, they had a house, they had a car, they um, bought groceries, um, he had clothes on his back, he was able to have notebooks that he could write in, as we're gonna find out also. So, so yes, he was poor, but... Like, compared to what? You know, that's my question here. 
So he didn't hit like skid row or like rock bottom poverty until his late teens, early 20s. Okay. Minor bitch. But um, the factual thing here is that it says he dropped out of high school in freshman year and then started working. That's not true. He went to high school, um, took a year off because of the boil situation, which you would read about in Ham on Rye and stuff like that. And then um, finished high school, started going to Los Angeles Community College, and then dropped out of there after either a year or two years. Can't remember exactly what. But a lot of it had to do with the start of World War II. Or America's involvement in World War II. And then he was pretty much done at that point. Kowski's writing got labeled as dirty realism. Which is a term I absolutely love and that is incredibly fitting. I too love the term dirty realism. I think it's so fucking cool. Um, it's so perfect for what Bukowski does. I've heard other people call it transgressive. I've heard other people call it kitchen sink. And I think that's actually a British term. But um, the dirty realism thing, I'm actually curious to find out where this started. And if you know, leave a comment down below. I can't remember if um, that was a Raymond Carver thing or if... I don't think it was coined because of Bukowski. A lot of people lumped Carver in with Bukowski around the, I guess, by the 70s. And um, it's always kind of weird because, like, if you like Bukowski and then you go, oh, like, Raymond Carver is the same thing. I should read him. And then you're like, what the fuck is this? Like, it's a, it's a kind of a mind fuck there. The other thing I wanted to say, Bukowski kind of had built up the 10-year drunk, which is what the... Um, book Factotum is basically supposed to be about where he didn't write anything for 10 years and that also isn't true and it's funny that this is something I'm like fact checking Bukowski on but he had a, not a lot but quite a few things picked up by different little magazines throughout this 10 year drunk and um, if you read Factotum there are parts in Factotum where he's writing and submitting stuff and all this other stuff. So this idea that like he didn't really write during this time, it's not like 100% accurate. He might not have been doing it seriously at this point, even though like he kind of wanted to. Like, what's that thing? He can't remember if this was on the Bukowski tapes or what, but he said something like, like during that time, like he had like a little ember, like just barely burning inside of him. Like, he knew it was there, and it was just barely burning. And as long as he could keep that barely burning, that was enough hope to keep pushing on and getting through. So when he finally decided to start writing again and really go with it, that it would, like, um, like just burst into a flame. So it wasn't like he was like, I'm not writing anymore. Okay, now I'm writing again. Like, that's kind of, like, blown out of proportion when a lot of people talk about that. Which he did not do, which Brandon did not do here. I'm just talking in general. Despite his hard living life, his hard drinking life, he was a prolific author. He wrote every single day for hours upon hours at his typewriter, cranking out page after page after page. Of okay, this is also not true. He wrote a lot and he was very prolific, but he did not write every single day. He says in a lot of his books and a lot of his stories, he talks about times when, like, he didn't write for a week and he felt like he was going to explode. You know what I'm saying? When he would start writing and it felt good, he would keep writing. If he sat down and started writing and it didn't feel good, he would stop. A lot of it was feeling-based and, like, getting the flow. And if you don't have it, you don't force it. You know, that's, like, 101 for him right there. He was an equally prolific reader with over 10,000 books in his personal collection at the time of his death at age 73 in 1994. How he... Okay, this thing is... This is... I'm going to call bullshit on. And I have no, like, factual evidence of this other than piecing together things, okay? 
the idea that he was a prolific reader and had over 10,000 books at the time of his death, I don't believe that at all. Not in the slightest. Because with Bukowski, most of the books he read, he read from the library. He checked them out. Okay? Like, all through the beginning of him. Okay? Then he got to the point where he hated reading so much because he felt everyone was putting out garbage that he kind of stopped reading. And he talks about that numerous times through so much of his own work that he just did not read other people's stuff because he thought it was bad. He had his favorites that he would read now and then. But I don't even know if he kept going back to him because I remember him saying something like, um, there was like one book he really liked and then he went back to it and um, years later and he didn't like it as much and it kind of broke his heart a little bit. So I don't even know if he was rereading stuff that he used to like. The other thing about this is if you watch um, Born Into This, the Bukowski documentary um, from the 90s, if you watch um, Bukowski, the um, Taylor Hackford documentary for PBS back in the 70s, if you watch um, the Bukowski tapes, if you watch any of the interviews that he did with Italian or German TV um, over the 80s and 90s, early 90s, obviously. If you look in those things, because most of those things were filmed in his house. If you look around, there's not a fucking bookcase around, let alone a fucking book. Okay. Now, I know that he had a small, like, two shelf bookcase. Um, in his apartment on Carlton Way that he kept, was it on Carlton or DeLong Prix? One of the two, it doesn't matter. Where he kept his books, the books that he wrote. And he would get a lot of little magazines in the mail that he was not, like, subscribed to, but, like, people would send him copies of this stuff. A lot of people would send him copies of their book in hopes that he would write a forward to it or that um, they just wanted him to see it because they wanted his approval kind of thing. But a lot of those books, he either acted like or um, said in jest that he had thrown out and like flushed down the toilet or thrown in the trash can and stuff like that. So this idea that he had all these books is just bonkers to me. And then the other thing about that is he has always been or always was the kind of guy that until he moved to San Pedro, that anything of value to him needed to be able to fit in a suitcase. If you had more stuff than could fit in a suitcase, you had too much shit because you're always on the move. You're always getting kicked out. So the idea of him collecting over 10,000 books at any point in his life, especially in late in life when he decided that reading anything was pointless, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Because the only thing he said he ever read was um, the newspaper for the race results and the racing form. And so he probably definitely had 10,000 racing forms just stacked up unless he threw them away and stuff. So that's a thing. Maybe, possibly. But books, no. I don't believe that at all. Not in the least bit. So, let me see the receipts on that one. Or pick up for yourself any of his many collections of poetry. This one is one of my favorites, The Flash of Lightning Behind the Mountain. And this is the essential Bukowski. Which is so, what I want to get at with this is that this book here, The Flash of Lightning Behind the Mountain, these books, even... Like, I mean, obviously, the Black Sparrow Press editions as well as the Echo editions. These are heavily edited to the point where they're almost unrecognizable, some of the poems in here. After Bukowski died, John Martin let, I think, two books pass without him heavily editing Bukowski's work, which would be... Um, Betting on the Muse and Bone Palace Ballet. After those books, 
this this sounds kind of fucked, but it's like very questionable how Bukowski those poems are. And there are plenty of things like if you Googled like um, the uh, Bukowski edit problem or Bukowski Martin edits or anything like that, you will find tons of sites that have poems next to each other. Because a lot of the poems that ended up in the later Bukowski poetry books were poems from way back when because Bukowski wasn't around writing new poems anymore. And a lot of these poems had been published in little magazines and stuff like that. So there is evidence of the actual poems that Bukowski wrote compared to the poems that were actually published by Black Sparrow and then later Echo. So that is something to think about. So if like one of your favorite Bukowski books is one that has been kind of heavily edited, that's... It's not that... <sighs> It's a questionable thing, but it's just like, it's just like, fuck, man. Like, those poems might not even, like, it's just, you gotta be wary about that, is all I'm saying. Um, The next book he has here, The Essential Bukowski, this is when Echo brought in um, Abel DeBrito to be the editor of Bukowski stuff. And to his credit, he had gone back and changed a lot of the stuff that John Martin had um, changed, okay? So in that essential Bukowski book, that's actually the only Bukowski poetry book that's widely accessible that I don't have, but I know what's in it and everything like that. That book has very good poems in it, and they're very, um, they're, they're the correct Bukowski versions. And so in case you're wondering, the ones that he um, edited, all the on books. So on drinking, on writing, on love, on cats. And then there was supposed to be the Bukowski 100, but that never came out. Um, So that's a whole other topic for a different day. Of all of his most popular and famous poems. I think I've read honestly, and I don't know if I could say this for anyone else, every single poem that Bukowski has ever and man does he have some absolute breathtakers just okay this right here i'm also going to call bullshit on and not in a shitty way because if you have read all of the books that echo or um, black sparrow put out his poetry books you would assume that you have read every poem bukowski's ever written But that's not true, like, because there are still tons of unreleased Bukowski stuff. And especially going back to that whole thing about edits, there are three books that are out that you could get on Lulu called Bukowski Manuscripts. Oh, I can't remember what the name of it is. It's like, I have them back there. I'm not going to grab them right now. But it's like Bukowski at the Machine Gun or Back to the Machine Gun, or something like that. And that's a lot of the poems that either were heavily edited by John Martin or had not been released because they were, like, sent out really early on. The other thing about that, too, is if you go to, like, Bukowski.net and look at the um, database of certain poems or whatever, um, you will find that a lot of the poems that are on, not not a lot, but a, a good number, big number of poems have not been released anywhere other than the magazine that they were originally found in. So unless like this dude has this amazing collection of like vintage um, little magazines, he probably hasn't read every poem Bukowski's written. Um, But that's okay. Like, the fact that, like, he wants to and has read as much as he has is fucking amazing. And I applaud him a lot. I don't usually read excerpts in these videos, but for today, just to set the stage, I'm going to read you another one of my favorite poems by Bukowski. This one is called The Proud Thin Dying. I see old people on pensions in the supermarkets, and they are thin, and they are proud, and they are dying. They are starving on their feet and saying nothing. Long ago, among other lies, they were taught that silence was bravery. Now, having worked a lifetime, inflation has trapped them. They look around, steal a grape, chew on it, 
Finally, they make a tiny purchase, a day's worth, another lie they were taught. Thou shalt not steal. They'd rather starve than steal. One grape won't save them. And in tiny rooms, while reading the market ads, they'll starve. They'll die without a sound. Pulled out of rooming houses by young blonde boys with long hair, who will slide them in and pull them away from the curb. These boys, handsome of eye, thinking of Vegas and pussy and victory. It's the order of things. Each one gets a taste of honey, then the knife. And this isn't the world's greatest Bukowski poem, but this is very indicative so of good. his style. I urge you to start with his first great anthology, which was written in 1974, Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame. It's his collective poems from 1955 to 1973, and is absolutely a perfect place to begin. Also, I'm not going to give you... Um, I'm, I'm just going to say, like, that might come off as a little misleading, but, like, Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame... Like, he said it was his first collected anthology or something like that. Those were the words he used. And that is kind of true, I guess. Um, a lot of the books that Bukowski has, like, I would consider kind of collected anthologies. Because until you get to probably, I think, War All the Time from, like, 83... That I think that was the first book of his that came out that said new poems on it. I think if anything had been released before, that would be you would be collecting either a selected or an anthology or something like that. So Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame. This is technically um if we are just going by Black Sparrow standards, this is technically his fourth book because this here, and it would not, and that's just by Black Sparrow standards because um, before that, the other two books that are collected in this, It Catches Its Heart in Its Hands and um, Crucifix in a Death Hand, those are, those were released before by Lujan Press. And I'm sure he knows this, and I'm not trying to fucking, like, say he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm saying in case you don't know, kind of thing. So, Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame is, like, a short book on its own. Like, if he was just to put this out, Burning in Water, Drowning in Flame, let's see, that's from 155 to 232 so that's not even a hundred page book okay so we're thinking it'll probably be pushing more along the lines of play the piano drunk um size so putting this together like this was kind of brilliant and it was super cool because it catches it hard in his hands and crucifix and a death hand were already being sold for ridiculous amounts on the secondary market and um at terror street in agony way um, that one did not have a very large print run. So that's cool that that got in here. But the thing I want to say about that is, is that this doesn't have like all of his stuff. It has a selection from Crucifix and a selection from It Catches My Heart. And I believe even a selection of Terror Street. I don't think it has all the Terror Street poems in here. I could be wrong about that, but um, yeah. So anyway, so that is Burning Water, Drowning in Flame. But before this came out, you still had um, these two books from Black Sparrow too. So um, The Days Run Away, Like Wild Horses Over the Hills, and Mockingbird Wish Me Luck. Um, if it's something where you want to read like more of the beginning, like the early Bukowski stuff, even though this is from 55 to 73... The Rooming House Madrigals is from 46 to 66. So, uh, yeah. And those poems were also poems that had been released in tons of little magazines and tons of chapbooks. And we're not even talking about the chapbooks. Like, I have videos about his chapbooks that I actually have to start putting more in. I ran into a fucking wall with it because... Um, Run with the Hunted, the original Run with the Hunted, is, I think is really big for a chap book. And I think that would be considered more of a book. Um, but we'll talk about that at a different time. Different video, different thing. So let's get back into this. 
right, for which collection of poetry to go through at what time. I'll do that more with his novels. So I'm going to put up on the screen 10 of my favorite Bukowski poems of all time. You can pause it here or take a screenshot, but I promise you, you read these poems, you will have a hard time not falling in love with this wonderful poet. Now that you've read Those some, some good poetry poems. and have an appreciation for before you read this one especially, I should give you a caveat that I should have given you at the beginning. I am someone who definitely believes in separating art from the artist. There are very crude and unfair and vulgar things in this book and in all of his works, whether it is rape jokes or the violence or sexism, misogyny, again, all of these things I don't deny. I am not trying to make a case for why Bukowski is a good man. I'm trying to make the case for why Bukowski is a good writer. And those are so two good. different things. So if you are someone who falls on the line of not separating the art so from the artist and not wanting to give any credit or credence to anyone who does not align with your political or moral values, use i understand that take i really do i don't particularly agree with it and this may not be the guy for you so that's my caveat that's my pulpit session let's move on let me say this too like i really appreciate that he said that because that is 100 percent accurate like none of us who like bukowski are saying bukowski is a good man at all we're saying he's a great writer you know what I'm saying? So I love the fact that he said that. Hot Water Music, another collection of short so stories good. that is so, so good. I think till I think Hot Water Music is the best collection of short stories Bukowski did. Um, I think it's better than South and No North. I think it's better than Tales of Ordinary Madness. And I think it's better than um, The Most Beautiful Woman in Town. Um I will tell you where I started. I started with his most popular by far, which is Post Office. Same this here. is what's so cool about Bukowski. He didn't start writing novels until he was 50 years old. He was working at the post office during that time, and a publisher offered him $100 a month to just write. This is all Bukowski needed to say, fine, let's give the novel thing a go. And his first published novel in 1971 is a work of prose fiction, and it is so Good. Again, I don't want to get too personal because I want this to be relatable for everyone, but I had been reading Bukowski's poetry for well over a decade when I found out that he even had novels. I heard this. Um, my thing here that I want to just add to this is that um, John Martin is the publisher that came to him who ended up doing Black Sparrow Press. And Black Sparrow had already put out, um, at that point, they he had already done a bunch of Bukowski broadsides. And he had done Terror Street. This is the other thing that's funny, is that all of the books that um, Black Sparrow or Echo put out, the very first page is a list of other books you can get and what year they came out. So yeah, so he had already put this one out. This came out in 69. Um, but what he said to Bukowski when he offered him $100 a month there in, um, I guess that was January of 1970, he said, like, I want to, I just want you to write. And if you ever decide you can write a novel, I would love if you could write a novel because novels sell better than poetry. And then Bukowski's like, okay. And then the legend has it that um, it took him three weeks to write Post Office. And um, so after three weeks, he called up John and said, okay, come pick it up. And he says, pick what up? And he's like, my novel. And he's like, you're what? And he's like, my novel. It's done. Come get it. Um, so that's the legend of how that worked out. And again, whenever you hear John Martin tell a story, you have to like take it with a grain of salt because like, there are so many things John Martin says that just like, um, you're like, what is he talking about? Like, he he gets things kind of muddled, and he'll, like, say, like, two different things and, like, put it together in one story like it's the thing that happened kind of deal. So in chronological order, we would actually start with Ham on Rye. So if you want to start here, Post Office would be third. If you want to read Post Office first, my recommendation, and then get into this, that's totally fine as well. Ham on Rye is his early childhood. It literally starts, if I'm remembering correctly, the opening scene is him at a funeral, hiding under a dining room table, having his first memory, watching the people's feet go by underneath. And we work up through his young childhood and early adolescence. I don't know if it was a funeral. Abusive father, my favorite. What is often considered to be 
his best novel is women. Post Office is his most popular, but this tends to be what people say is his best writing. Have sex with him in LA, he would go through multiple wives before ending up with Linda Lee, his third wife who stayed with him until his death. And though they're- Okay, and Linda Lee is his second wife, not his third wife. Barbara Fry was his first wife. And he was with her for like two years. Before that, he was with uh, Jane Coney Baker. And he was with her for like 10 years. And like when he talks about Jane, it's like Jane was like the love of his life kind of thing. They weren't married ever. Like when she was in the hospital um, dying, he told them that he used to be her common law husband. Um so make of that what you will. Um, and then Linda King, he wasn't married to. And Cupcakes, he definitely wasn't married to. But um, Linda Lee was his um, second wife. A ton of scrutiny on women. There is also a ton of scrutiny on man and himself. That is the one thing that Bukowski is, even if he is a womanizer, even if he is a misogynist, he is fair at least fair in terms of pointing the finger back at himself what's wrong with him why he's in these relationships why he's in the wrong kind of relationships why he couldn't possibly respect himself or the women that he's with etc so this is the story about women in his life from his mother all of his lovers to all of his wives and to some that he really did cherish and respect that had major major impacts on him so women would be next in the order that we're talking about holly i don't really think women is about his mother I'm trying to think of when his... Because his mother died before his father. And I'm trying to remember if the dad dying is in post office or if it's in women. But it, do, it doesn't matter. I just... I, I, I feel like he's kind of grandizing a little bit of what women is from what it really is. Which is the time when women finally started throwing themselves at him and he was able to kind of like date heavily play the field do all this stuff and kind of figure out for the first time what that part of life is like since he never really had that yeah but like women is a great book i i think it's awesome it and it's really it he, how he said like ham on rye is a coming of age story I think women is also a coming of age story, but it's about a a dude who it took him until his fifties to find out like what was really important in life kind of thing. He's doing all the stupid things that like a normal, like 14 or 15 year old, 16 year old would be doing, but he's doing it in his fifties. And I feel like, especially with that book, a lot of people don't see it is that they see it as him just bragging about all the ass he's getting and that's not really what the book is he's like miserable like most of the time trying to figure out how to juggle women and what to do with them kind of thing and he's fucking terrified of them the whole fucking time not quite a departure from this but it does focus a lot on the making of the movie about his life called barfly barfly is a real movie starring mickey rourke as him and he does a wonderful job playing bukowski i don't think he does a very good job pulp is the kind of book you are either going to love or hate this is his true departure from semi-autobiographical work and this is an ode to the pulp writers of the detective style fiction bukowski did not i'm going to disagree with this right here like this is technically his book about it's like a fiction book but it's more so like it's not as much a book of fiction as it is a smart book about him trying to figure out his own mortality he wrote this book while he was dying basically he just came out of a really bad case of tb that should have killed him and then ended up with um lymphoma that ended up killing him And I wanted to talk about this a little bit earlier, but this is a good place to have it. But the, um, the captain is out to lunch, his like journal entries, these, those journal entries in that book were written around the time that he was writing pulp and pulp is really just as much of a semi autobiographical account of him. It's almost like, that flash that you like right before you die you see your whole life flash before your eyes 
it's kind of like that but it also it being a detective novel i think is really really curious because i feel like he's trying to figure out like what was it all for like bukowski is the detective trying to figure out like what the fuck was he living for what did his life mean what good was it and what happens now so as much as pulp is a fiction novel i really really feel like deep down it was the most autobiographical of his books because it like if you look at just like metaphor in general pulp is all metaphor for his life and this is very funny because it's coming from a guy who really didn't he wasn't known as someone who used a lot of metaphor and pulp is bukowski's life as a metaphor so um i think pulp is an excellent read especially after you've read his novels and i i really feel like if you want to take the journey and know who bukowski is read the books in chronological order instead of publication order or how he likes to read them um, so you would go ham on rye factotum post office women hollywood pulp i think that is the best way to do it if you are looking to be entertained but also to get to know the man yeah i, I just really think pulp is just as autobiographical as the other ones are quite do that to that degree he let that authoritative voice that he had really speak and he did not try to hinder or suppress it we see bukowski being bukowski still even in a novel not about bukowski some people are going to love that some people are going to hate it this is probably my least favorite of his novels i do think we would have seen an evolution on this kind of novel if he continued to write but i believe he died shortly after writing this book and we never got another novel from him i think this is for the true fans that just want to round out their bukowski read. and what i will say about that is he finished pulp and then died and then pulp was released that same year in 94 so um yeah he was not alive when the book came out so outside of even the novels i would recommend you find a biography my favorite that i've come across that i've actually read in its entirety because of his fairness to bukowski where others who wrote biographies really just tried to condemn the man which is fine i understand that and it's a great critique but this tells the story of his life it's called locked in the arms of a crazy life by howard soons the story of charles bukowski i would encourage this book here is um a great book it's probably the best biography that i've read of bukowski but it still has like s the problem i have with bukowski biographies is that they spend so much time on shit that if anyone has read any bukowski they already know they spend so much time going over like everything that's in ham on rye everything that's in factotum they they do this whole fucking thing and every once in a while there'll be something sprinkled in there that is like kind of like oh shit i didn't know that and that's really fucking cool there are um still a couple that i haven't been able to get my hands on but um that this one here is probably the best but again if you've read a lot of bukowski some of this book is going to seem like shit you already know or shit you've already read so like just be prepared for that okay i'm gonna give him a subscribe because he did a really fucking great job there and i would love to talk to him more go give him a sub like he did a really good job with that video and like a lot of the stuff that he said that i'm having quibbles with like are not like big deals by any means like there are other videos out there that are like complete and utter crap like they just say things that have like there's like no fact information whatsoever this one's really good so um give brandon a sub there um that, that was really good and let me know what you think um am i wrong about stuff i get shit wrong all the time the only reason why i'm able to do these videos is because i've read so much bukowski that i 
accidentally became a minor authority on the subject. You know what I'm saying? So if any of you out there are like, oh, yeah, you're wrong about this, tell me. Because, like, fuck, someone's got to fucking tell me if I'm wrong about something. Shit. Love to hear it. But anyway, what do you think? Um, are you digging it? Uh, do you know of any other Bukowski videos out there that are just out there and you want me to fact check them? That'd be fun. Yeah, let's do it like that. Because um, Chase sent me this video, which I really appreciate. Thank you for doing that. Um, if you guys find any other ones, let me know. And just so you guys know, I put up a poll. And I don't know what anyone is going to do about the poll. But um, I'm going to be doing um, monthly read-alongs of his poetry. And this month, May, we're going to be doing um, The Days Run Away Like Wild Horses Over the Hills. So if that's something you want to do, let me know. And um, if you want to get my new chapbook, Me as an Action Figure... It's going to be on my Etsy shop. Link will be down below. You can pick that up. So until next time, everybody, type hard, and I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys, and thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.